I show you guys those clips just for the simple fact that um, you ever heard the expression of, I can't help it. That's just the way that I am. I, I don't know how many of you all have ever used that excuse or that expression before, but I, I certainly have. And um, it's, it's so easy to base it upon the way that we have been raised or the way that we have been taught that, that forms our habits and our attitudes. But see, God doesn't want us to, to just be that way. God wants to change us. God wants us to say, that's just not the way that I am. And tonight we're going to look at two specific different misfits of how they formulate this attitude of not being just who they are. And so if you are joining us for the very first time this evening, we have been in a series for the last couple of weeks entitled Misfits. A misfit is somebody who is unique, someone who is different, someone who is an oddball. Uh, they're a black sheep. They don't fit the mold in culture or society per se. And for the last couple of weeks, we have looked at some various men who are misfits in the book of Acts, specifically in chapters 8 through 10. And what made these guys misfits is because they didn't fit the norm of society. They thought differently, they spoke differently, they acted differently, and they lived differently. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. They lived differently all for the sake of Jesus Christ. So if you will, we're going to be looking in the continuation of the series in Acts chapter 10 in the New Testament. And um, what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be looking at chapter 10 verses 1 through 29. And then next week will actually be the last week of the series. We will finish next week in verses 30 through 48. So as you are... Unpacking as you guys are opening your Bibles and so forth, we're we'll be looking in chapter 10. And chapter 10 is pivotal. It's extremely important because this is when the gospel goes to a Gentile's house. Goes to the house of a Gentile, which we'll see here in just a bit, and his entire household. But at the same time, chapter 10 is a turning point. For the book of Acts and for the entire New Testament because the gospel is fanned out throughout different geographical regions throughout the entire world to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to remind you, this is very important that you put this in your mind or you write this down. As we begin to look at chapter 10, this is 10 years. This is 10 years after the ascension of of Jesus Christ in heaven. So this is 10 years after Pentecost. And I will explain why this is so very important later on. So 10 years have passed. But tonight we're going to be looking at two specifically different misfits. One is by the name of a guy named Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, and Peter, who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. But we're going to look at them of how they had a change of heart of that's not who I am attitude. So, we start off with the idea of misfits have a change of heart. And we're going to look at how this plays out, starting in chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. It says this. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all of his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, well, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he explained all these things that happened, he sent them to Joppa. Now, 
So here's what's taking place. You have a man named Cornelius. Him and his household want to know God. Okay? So an angel, a messenger of God shows up, says, hey, God recognizes your prayers and what you're doing. This is what you need to do. You need to send three trusted men to Joppa to go send for a guy named Peter and to bring him back to your household. Caesarea is about 31 miles north of Joppa. Caesarea also was Rome's administrative capital of Judea. Now, if you look into the text, Cornelius would have been, uh, we'll see later on, he was a very highly respected man in Judea. His rank was, he was overseeing, he was in charge of a hundred soldiers. But what's also interesting is verses 2. Verses 2, it says that a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. Now, a lot of times in the New Testament, you will see this, particularly at least five times that they were devout or God-fearing. That does not necessarily mean in this context that Cornelius was saved. And we know that because when you look in chapter 11, starting in verses 13, Peter is talking to the other apostles and his brethren, his brothers. He says, and he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house. Who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and your household will be saved. So Cornelius has not been saved yet. Okay. He's offering sacrifices to God as prayers because he can't, as a Gentile, he can't go into the synagogue. He can't go into the temple. So his sacrifice unto God is offering his prayers unto God. So if I can, to simplify this, let me, let me explain this. I wrote this down. It says, Cornelius and his family responded positively to the exposure of the God of Israel without embracing in any detailed way elements of Jewish legal practice. To simplify that, he was a respected religious man. He did all of these things religiously, and yet he was still searching to know the one triune God. But I want you to go back to verses 8. I want you to go back to verses 8 where it says, So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. This is what makes this guy a mystic. He is calling three trusted men. Okay? And this is how the conversation pretty much goes. Hey, guys, I just was visited by an angel of God, and he's telling me to send you guys 31 miles a day and a half to a Jew's house. And I want you to go get him, and I want you to bring him back to my house. Misfits, number one, have a change of heart who don't care what others think they don't care what others think of them. And here's the reason why. Because of their devotion to God. Number two, they don't care what others think of them, how bizarre this sounds or how crazy this looks. Because the other thing is they anticipate God's move in their life. Pastor Jesse just mentioned about the lady that brought the book bags. I had an amazing opportunity to speak with this lady this past Thursday. She actually has a, a kind of a, it, it's called like a brown bag ministry for middle school and high school students to give them food throughout the weekends. Um, so they have food and so forth since they eat breakfast and lunch at schools and so forth. But a couple years ago, uh, she saw in a paper that it pretty much in the obituary, it said a prostitute died. That's pretty much it. And it, it, it burdened her because she looked at it and said, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's best friend, that's somebody. And what was happening is that she was anticipating God's move in her life. Something was going to happen. Well, through her brown bag ministry, long story short, she met this boy who lived with his grandparents because his mom was that prostitute who was murdered. Mm. And this woman now is ministering to 250 prostitutes just in the Huntington area. 
But I say that when I found this out, she didn't care what others thought of her when people, when she was like, look, this is what I'm going to do. This is what God wants me to do. She was faithful to that. And so as he sent them, in Joppa, we see in verses 9 through 16, this is what's taking place in Joppa. It says, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound to the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals in the earth, wild beasts, creepy things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no, no, not, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So, this is pretty much what's going down. Peter's hungry. It's lunchtime. Goes up on the roof. And he falls into a trance. He sees a blanket, a sheet, a piece of fabric fall from heaven. It has all of these animals. And basically, God said, hey, look, it is okay to eat pork. It's okay to eat some barbecue. Go ahead. <laughs> but Peter says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. Now, I want you to find something that's very interesting. Look at verses 9. And why this is interesting is because the typical time for a Hebrew to pray was at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. But he's praying at 12 p.m. Here's my second thing. Misfits have a change of heart when prayer is involved. Misfits have a change of heart when prayer is involved. I tell my family this all the time. Prayer is simply this. Prayer is talking to God about anything, anytime, anywhere. And see, those misfits have a change of heart when prayer is involved. Those who seek God will find him. You can find that in Hebrews 11, 6. And this is exactly what Cornelius did. You look in verses 2. This is what he was. He was praying. This is what we find out later on in chapter 11. He was praying that God reveal himself somehow because there was something missing. And we get a picture of his prayer that God was revealing more light to him. And what's even more interesting is that when Cornelius prayed was the exact same time that the afternoon offering would have been at the temple in Jerusalem. So Peter has this trance. A trance is just another expression of a vision. But a trance is that God is specifically talking to you while you're awake one-on-one. -on -one. And so if you can show the slides, if you can show the next one, there. Um, okay, so... In essence, this, this blanket, this sheet, this material comes. And this is based upon the Mosaic law based out of Leviticus 11. So God is telling him, this is a new era. This is a new covenant because of what my son Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. Go ahead and eat. And here, Peter is thinking that he is a beating. He's thinking he's thou holy. No, surely not. And God says, it's okay. Everything is, is good. Everything is clean. But see, the vision was not necessarily about food laws. The vision that Peter saw was all about God's attitude and his heart toward his people. God wasn't trying to change Peter's diet. God was trying to change Peter's heart from, this is just the way that I am. He was trying to change his heart because you understand that a Jew would look at it and say, I'm clean. But a Jew Gentile is unclean. But God was trying to say, no, 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 no. Jew, Gentile, everybody is unclean before the holy, righteous God. Without the mercy and grace of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, all are unclean. And so overall, what this picture represented is that a Gentile didn't have to go through these motions to do these things to become a Jew, to become a follower of Christ. No, a Gentile could eat some barbecue and still be a follower of Christ. So, as this is taking place, verses 17 
through 22. Is this taking place? Is this now? While Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which he had seen, meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. If you're taking notes, you might want to start with that. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men, get that, three, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation, which means of Judea, of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear the words from you. So, while Peter is perplexed, he's wondering, he's thinking about what this vision is going on, the Spirit of God says, hey, Peter, there are three men Outside the courtyard at the gate, they're summoning for you. They're asking for you. Go and see what they want. Now, I come to this. Because remember I told you in the beginning, 10 years have passed. Remember Acts 1, 8, Jesus told them that the gospel was going to go out to where? Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, to the ends of the earth. But 10 years, have y'all noticed this? The Gentiles went to the Jews' house. Ten years have passed after Jesus has ascended to the Father. And there still has not been any proclamation of the gospel. Ten years have passed. And I think about that and I look at that and say, man, they're just like us at some times. We have a difficult times with being obedient as well. How many of you all ever say this? God, send me a sign. Make that cloud into a bird. Or send me a sign for open up this parking space. Or send me just a sign of this green light. Right? <clears throat> but here's the thing. Misfits have a change of heart when obedient to the Holy Spirit. Misfits have a change of heart when they're obedient to the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 16 that three times, three times, three messengers... God said three times, which means God is saying, I'm not changing my mind. I'm not changing my will. I'm not changing my purpose for this to be done. I point this out because there may be some of you all in this room right now that you know the very next step that God has for you in your life. Whatever that step may be, you know it. That's between you and God. But sometimes what we do in life is you know what you need to do or what Jesus is asking you to do. But we stand there and argue, and we go back and forth, rather than what we should be doing is being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Misfits have a change.